So raise your hand if you like mushrooms. Now there's all different kinds of ways you can consume mushrooms, kitchen being one of the best ones. But did you know that you can also use mushrooms to bring natural color into your dye practice? It's true. Hi, this is Margaret Bird. Welcome to Color Quest. If you followed along last week, you'll see that I went to this incredible symposium all about mushroom and lichen dyeing. I learned so much and had a fantastic time. And the breadth of color that can come from mushrooms and lichen is absolutely incredible. So this week, I would like to look at one of the most common mushroom dyes, one that's considered to be quite easy and readily available if you are out there on a mushroom foray and that is the Dyer's Polypore. So let's go chop some of that up from the foraging trip I took a few weeks ago and see what kind of beautiful dye it wants to share with us. I want to go on record as saying I know very little about mushroom and lichen dyes. I have dabbled a bit in lichen dyeing, but the amount of variation in terms of species and then the resulting color palette is so varied and diverse, it's going to take a long time for me to test them all out and feel like I know just a tiny bit more. However, the Fungi and Fiber Symposium was a fantastic starting point for me to learn and pique my interest even that much more to dive in to the wildly beautiful world of mushroom and lichen dyes. So as you saw in last week's video, I was lucky enough to go on a foray with a group of people from the symposium, one of which took me by the hand and helped me to see what may be underneath my feet and right in front of my face, she found an incredible Dyer's polypore. And she was kind enough to give me some of that, which I brought home. I've had it sitting out on my porch for the last few weeks, so it's dried up a bit, but that's okay. I just want you to see what it looks like. A little bit different than what it looked like when we grabbed it and certainly different from some of the super fresh ones that were found on the foray. You can see all that beautiful yellow dye right there. This polypore is new from this year, so it should produce those colors, but it might be slightly different than expected. Take a look at this. So here is what the dyer's polypore looks like after a few weeks of drying. You can still see the yellowish color on the underside here and I have pieces that have broken off since then but all of this is going to be perfect for me to try out my first dye session on my own with this wonderful dyer's polypore. So let's go take this in and start working with it. So beyond what I learned in the symposium was that I became familiar with a woman by the name of Miriam Rice. Sadly, she's no longer with us, but she wrote several books, one of which I was lucky enough to pick up at the symposium. And this book will be a resource for me that I will be very grateful to have as I work my way through learning more about mushroom and lichen dyeing. So if you get interested as well, I can recommend this book as a must have in your Dyer's library. So today we're gonna to be looking at Dyer's polypore. That is the common name for this mushroom. However, all of these mushrooms have Latin names. And as I understand it, many of them have been reclassified and changed over the years. So I heard a lot of these names flying around when I was at the symposium and they were hard to identify or to recognize. Slowly but surely over the week, I started to see some of the same names and 
became better at recognizing some of these names. The Latin name of Dyer's polypore is Feolus schweinitzii. Try to say that 10 times fast. When you are surrounded by people who are throwing these Latin names around all week, it's a little overwhelming. But I will tell you that, trust me, the more you hear them, the more you will start to recognize them and maybe even pronounce them correctly. All right, a few things that are known to be recommended when it comes to working with mushrooms is that protein fibers like wool and silk work beautifully. Some will say that cellulose fibers are more difficult, as you might imagine, and some would even say, don't bother with that. But you know me, we always like to try it all out and see what happens. And I do believe with proper mordening, I will be able to capture some of the color that the dyer's polypore wants to share with me. So similar to many kinds of dye matter, we are going to start with a one to one ratio between the weight of the mushroom dye matter and the dry weight of fiber. This is just a great place to start. There may be some mushrooms that require more, require less, you know how it goes, but we'll start with that one to one. I'm not going to be dying much in the way of fiber. I rarely do here on Color Quest, so I'm less concerned about having enough dye matter. I do know that dyer's polypore is known to be quite strong, so you might be able to get away with less than a one-to-one, -one, but it's always a great place to start. So I have to laugh. I have been gone for about two months, of which I did not have access to a scale. So I've had to do all kinds of work in my dye studio without measuring anything. And guess what? My scale just died. So I'm not gonna weigh my dyer's polypore today. Since I'm dying such a small amount of fiber, I know I'm gonna have plenty. But isn't that kind of funny? Hmm, I wonder if Maria is sending me vibes from Peru. <laughs> so you know what's gonna come next, and that is we need to prep our fiber. So you're going to want to scour it or give it a good wash. All of my fiber has already been scoured except for my wool. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a stovetop application of that. Very simple, I'm going to be using this washing powder that I have and just put it on the stove and simmer that wool for about an hour. Get it cleaned up and then we need to talk about mordants. So alum is going to be the mordant of choice for many of the mushroom dyes and certainly for the dyer's polypore. I'm going to pre-treat my wool with alum. My silk and cellulose have already been treated with alum. And I'm also going to pre-treat a skein of wool and the other fibers in an iron mordant. Now, I have never pre-treated fiber with iron before. I almost exclusively do an after soak in an iron bath to shift a dye color or add the iron to the dye itself to shift it. But while I was at the symposium, they were using pre-treated and dried fiber that had both alum and then separately iron and putting those into the same dye pot. I was shocked to say the least, but also saw how very effective that can be if you want to have the color modification that iron can bring without changing your dye bath itself. Now, you can always do this as an after soak in iron, but I thought, why not try that out? And I could share it here with you because maybe it's a super efficient way to be making multiple colors from the same dye pot at the same time. And since I'd like to do a cold mordant, that means I'm going to be soaking the pieces in alum overnight. And at the same time, I'm going to be soaking the dyer's polypore overnight. It has dried from being out on my porch, and it's recommended that if you have the time to soak your mushroom prior to using it, 
like overnight. That's just gonna help sort of loosen that up and maybe allow for more color to come out. And as with most dye matter, we're gonna wanna break it up into smaller pieces. The more surface area there is for the color to be extracted. You can see on the inside, it's got a bit of a yellowish cast. I'm just gonna keep breaking that up and get that soaking overnight. So for the alum, I'm going to use 15% weight of fiber. Again, I don't have scale, but at home, weigh it out. I know that my wool is probably not even an ounce, so I'll work with one ounce of dried fiber, and we'll measure 15% of that weight in order to determine my alum. Then for iron, separately, I'm going to be making an iron bath for a pretreatment mordant. I'm gonna be using 2% iron or ferrous sulfate for the weight of fiber. So again, I'm gonna calculate with about one ounce of fiber just to make it easy for myself without a scale, but at home, be sure to weigh those out so that you have a good idea that you have a strong enough mordant of both alum and iron. So we'll measure those out and then we will dissolve them in hot water, add them to a pot filled with water that can accommodate our fibers and then place our scoured fibers into those two pots to sit overnight and just do a nice long cold soak in the mordant. All right, it is the next day. I am going to pull out the wool from both the iron bath as well as the alum bath. And unlike what I normally do, which is rinse them, I'm going to follow the instructions of Miriam Rice and the other dyers from the mushroom group and not wash them. I'm going to let them sit and dry after they're dry and set for a while, then I'm gonna wash them to try to remove some of that excess. And then we can start working on our dye bath. Check it out with the overnight soak of the Dyer's Polypore. Already got some pretty decent color in there. So this has been soaking overnight and wow, look at that color just from sitting here. So definitely gonna be having some pretty deep colors there. So I have never actually used a pre-iron bath method and it's so interesting to see actually the color of the fiber that's been sitting here. I also would never choose to leave something in iron for so long. You do have to be careful with protein fibers and iron but that was what was recommended for this process with the mushrooms so I did that and you can see it's already like this beautiful gold color so the idea would be this would shift to a green and then I have my pieces as well I put in my other pieces to have an iron soak since we're gonna be testing out those fibers so I'm gonna take those out now set them aside not rinse them as I mentioned I will let them dry and just set for the day and then we'll wash them after to get off any excess iron that hasn't stuck to the fiber there we go i will do the same for the alum soaked wool let that sit dry and then rinse it after
Wow, that is a Sun Strong dye. I have only had them in for maybe 15 minutes, could be 20, and I already have pulled out the alum piece because it has gotten so dark. It's turning into like this really deep yellowish brown. So I decided to pull it out. I know that you could probably leave this in for a shorter or even amount of time if you wanted to keep it a more middle tone yellow, but I just wasn't paying attention and boom, here it is. I'm gonna rinse it and then since that is already so strong I'm gonna go ahead and pull out the iron piece as well what I'm not gonna pull out are the silk and cotton pieces because they barely have any color on them at all so we may end up with one of these cellulose issues if you will I also threw in a piece of wool skein that didn't have any mordant on it. I decided to see if that really made a big difference or if it maybe changed the shade of the yellow. So we'll take a look at all of those together once the other pieces are done. So pretty amazing stuff, right? I particularly love the depth of the brown that I got with the iron mordant wool piece. And I thought I would potentially get green. When I was at the symposium, we did achieve green with Dyer's Polypore and iron. But I think that this was just so strong and took it to such a golden color. Brown was the obvious shift there, but it looked beautiful. Interesting how the cellulose pieces didn't really shift much, whether it was iron or alum. They were slightly saddened, but fairly similar in hue. And the silk did do a little bit of a shift, as we would expect with a protein fiber. So next week on color quest i'd say let's take a look at lichen as the other plant in the fungi world and look at how we can welcome color on the stove top with at least one or two varieties of lichen if it is still foraging season where you live get out there i'm sorry that i can't teach you much about how to find these mushrooms but look for your local mycology society, talk to people, get on the internet. You will figure out how to identify these beautiful options for natural color. Have a great week and I'll see you next Friday. So the Latin name is Feolis Schweitzenai. Schweitzenai. Oh my God, it's so hard to say. Oh, oh my gosh.